Welcome to Confirmation Lesson 10. I'm Pam Bentley, the Volunteer Engagement and Hospitality and Events Coordinator here at Floris. Today I have the privilege of talking with you about the church. When you hear the word church, what comes to mind? If you ask everyone in your small group what they think of when they hear the word church, I bet you would get a lot of different answers. Some might talk about the actual church building. Some might mention an event that happened at church or a retreat they went on. Some might mention the music in their definition, the band or the choir. Some might talk about a specific worship service or experience like Christmas Eve or Easter. And some might mention a moment in the service like a baptism or a communion. Church means a lot of things to people. It means a lot of things to me. And probably the biggest thing I think about when I think of church are the people. There's a song that says, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. That's so true, and I hope you'll keep that in mind. To get a full perspective of the church in a very short amount of time, let's take a jump back in time to look at the early church, the one that formed soon after Jesus' resurrection. This is actually 50 days after Jesus' resurrection on the day we celebrate as Pentecost. We find this story of the early church in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Hear these words. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. This account in Acts 2 is where we visibly see the Holy Spirit come to the disciples who were gathered. Those gathered are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they're able to speak their experiences with Jesus to others in many other languages. Jesus had promised to send the Holy Spirit as an advocate, a helper, to his followers. And this right here is where we visibly see evidence of this happening. The Holy Spirit is an advocate with them to help them. Looking further down in this text, listen to this in verses 38 through 41 where Peter speaks. Peter replied, Change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God invites. With many other words, he testified to them and encouraged them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people into the community on that day. Not only were the apostles empowered, they went out and started sharing the news of Jesus with others. This is so important to notice, because right here is where we see people actively going out and talking about Jesus to others. This was the start of the early church. Continuing in Acts, notice what happens next in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day, they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. 
The apostles were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They went out and shared the news about Jesus and others started to join them. I love this picture of the early church devoting themselves not just to the apostles' teachings, but also to the community and to sharing meals together and spending time together. That sounds like church to me. And it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there with them. It also reminds me of the Great Commission that Jesus spoke and Matthew recorded. In Matthew 28, 19, we hear Jesus say, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If I were to sum up those two important statements, it would be this. Gather in community and be the church. This is exactly what we see the early Christians doing in the book of Acts, the early church. We also see two things happening in the book of Acts that remind the people of God's presence with them. These are the sacraments of baptism and communion. Baptism marks the moment we become a part of God's family. As Methodists, we believe you can be baptized at any time, as a baby, as a child, as a teenager, or as an adult. We also believe that you only need to be baptized once because God is at work in that moment during your baptism. Even if you don't remember being baptized, God does. Communion is a way for us to remember Jesus' death and resurrection. When we participate by eating the bread and drinking the juice, we are sharing in a feast with other believers all over the world. As Methodists, we celebrate an open communion table, meaning that anyone who wants to be united with Christ can participate in communion at any age or stage of life. It is not our table, it's Christ's table. All are welcome. Baptism and communion have been happening since the days of the early church, and we continue to celebrate these sacraments today. It's incredible and humbling to think about being a part of the story of God through these sacraments, to be a part of Christian traditions that have lasted over 2,000 years and continue on. Now we're going to jump ahead in history to the 1700s and a man named John Wesley, the Reverend John Wesley. John Wesley was a theologian and an Anglican priest, part of the Church of England. We know John Wesley to be the founder of United Methodism. He didn't set out to start a new church. He simply wanted to know God better, to live a devout life, and to find ways for others to do the same. He was so meticulous in his pursuit of discipleship that he and those who were part of what they called the Holy Club at Oxford were teased and called Methodists because they were so methodical in their discipline of prayer and worship and Bible study. That name stuck, Methodist. Reverend John Wesley was never a pastor in the Methodist Church, but he started the Methodist movement within the Anglican Church. He felt the Methodist movement aligned with the Church of England, so he himself remained an Anglican priest. John Wesley has a fascinating background, and if I had more time, we could talk much more about him and his influence in our theology today. I encourage you to take time to learn more about John Wesley. But for the sake of time, I want to focus on a couple of things that John Wesley did that are really important. First, John Wesley said this, the world is my parish. He meant that he saw the whole world as a church that needed to hear the gospel. Moving beyond boundaries of a single town or village, John Wesley would preach outdoors and in new towns and in pastures and fields, and he encouraged others 
to go out and do the same. Think about how entirely inclusive that is for a pastor to consider everyone a part of their church, not just the people who show up on a Sunday morning. That's a big concept that goes a long way in how we view church today. The United Methodist Church is indeed a global church. You can find Methodist churches in every part of the world, in 60 countries, and it is incredible to think of this connectivity we have worldwide. That all started with John Wesley's idea of church being bigger than a building. That's really important. Another really important thing to know about John Wesley is that he taught three simple rules. He lived by these rules and preached about these rules, and they've been passed down through generations. These three simple rules have withstood the test of time, and they continue to be best practices for us. Here they are. Rule number one, do no harm. Number two, do good. And number three, stay in love with God. These rules were meant not just for those leading worship, but for everyone who was a part of the church. And the same is true for us today. These three simple rules help us align what we think and say and do with what God wants for us and intends for us. First, to make sure we are not doing harm to each other, to ourselves, to God, to the environment. It's a tall order, and we won't always get it right because none of us are perfect, but it means we keep asking the question, is what I am doing harmful in any way to anyone or anything else? Second, we need to intentionally seek out ways to do good. Imagine if everyone woke up every day and said, I'm going to do all the good I can today. You have the choice each day to do just that, to find ways to do good in your world, and it can make all the difference to those around you. And third, staying in love with God means intentionally seeking out ways to be connected to God through prayer, through reading your Bible, going to worship, participating in retreats, and not just occasionally doing these things, but making them a part of your life. Three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. John Wesley also gave us a tool to evaluate the world around us. This tool is called the Wesley quadrilateral, and it gives us a way of looking at the world through four sides or four lenses of scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. Here's how it works. Take any instance in life and apply what you know about those four things. Scripture. What does the Bible say about that thing? Does it say anything? Why does it say what it says? How is what it says appropriate to the time it was written? And how does it apply today in this world we live in now? Reason. This is where you ask, does it make sense? Given what you know about the world, does this thing make sense? Tradition. What does the tradition of our church say about this thing? Beyond just scripture, are there other teachings we can tap into to better understand this thing? Experience. Based on your previous experience and lessons learned, what do you think of this thing? The Wesley Quadrilateral can be used for big theological questions or for smaller personal questions. It's a tool that helps us evaluate the world around us in a way that involves God. I love that it includes four different aspects from which to view whatever it is you are evaluating. 
Wesley valued human thought and experience in addition to scripture, and he felt it was all relevant when figuring out the world around us. Often, taking time to look at things from all four sides through these four lenses helps us better understand what God wants for us and for the world around us. Okay, so we've talked about the church and its initial beginnings, and we've talked a bit about John Wesley and his vision for church and how we live into that vision today. I want to share with you a bit about my experience with church. I've attended church since I was a little kid, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I really understood and appreciated the church. At the start of this session, we said that the church is the people. It is the community we are together. I'm a part of a military family that moved around quite a bit. Every move took us away from family members, away from friends, away from whatever community we had become close to. But in each new place, within a few weeks of moving in, we would look for a church for two reasons. One, to stay close to God, and two, because church gave us a new community. Moving to a new place can be lonely, but in my experience, church provided acceptance and care. I'm so grateful for the people of the church that invited us for Thanksgiving dinner just a few weeks after we moved. And the people of the church who brought meals and prayed with us when my daughter was in the hospital. And the people of the church that pulled us into a group performing a Christmas play and then to join them in a life group. I know church to be a place where I belong. And I hope you feel that too. Church is about the people, the community. We saw that community take shape in the scriptures we read from Acts. We learned about how the Methodist community was shaped by John Wesley, and all of that is great. But right now, it comes down to your community. You are 10 weeks into confirmation, and I hope you are starting to feel connected to the church, connected to others in your small group, to your mentors, to your small group leaders. Confirmation is about making a commitment to your community, to your church. Like the people of the early church, you too are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You are shaped by your experiences. You are capable of doing so much good. God wants you to be an important part of the church. But that's going to require your decision and your commitment. Know that your unique contributions are important to the continuing story of God. I hope this has been helpful for you. Thanks for listening.